My name is Juja Milei. I'm a professor of early childhood education at Tampere University, Finland. A recent article in The Guardian titled Lessons in Patriotism Used to Justify Ukraine's Invasion to Russia's Children reports on how state-approved Russian textbooks edit out positive references to Ukraine. The Russian education minister, it is also conveyed, suggested that from September, schools will hold flag-raising days, sing the national anthem each morning. While in general, raising flag and singing the national anthem seems as insignificant patriotic acts, the journalist does not read them as such. He argues that this is the way the Russian invasion is justified. This example shows well how everyday patriotic acts can be suddenly valorized for highly questionable political purposes. In this case, amassing Russian public support for Putin's war on Ukraine. The public often views patriotism as a form of nationalism. It is evaluated mostly in positive terms. It is a love of one's nation. In contrast, if nationalism is mentioned in public forums, it is dominantly understood in negative terms. It is associated with the feeling of superiority of one's nation over others. It is also understood as an aggressive feeling and the cause of war, just as in this reporting. In research, the understanding of nationalism is more complex. I understand nationalism in my research as a cultural project continuously creating the nation as an imagined community. Flags, national anthems, creation myth, traditions, seeks to create and hold this imagined community together. They serve as commonly understood elite symbols and discourses. While many fear belonging to a national community when the Olympics is on, it is important to emphasize that not everyone relates the same way to their nations. At times, people criticize or simply reject its ideals, values or practices. In everyday life, the nation is signaled in many ways. These could be customs such as punctuality or routines, for example, the specific time of the day to eat lunch. The kind of food one consumes can also have national characteristics. There are also national sports, and preferred holiday locations for each nation. These practices help in maintaining and creating the national community. They also offer a feeling of belonging and attachments to the national soil. At the same time, these practices also serve as continual reminders of who we are and what we believe in, therefore contribute to one's national identity formation and way of life. Children are also part of national communities, but in research they receive much less attention. Some of the available studies show how through socialization in schools, children become national subjects. Studies reveal how by learning national histories and traditions, or through participation in national sports, children pick up knowledge, customs and virtues that are national in character. Civic education or the history and literature curriculum often portray national heroes or writers to whom children learn to look up to. The deeds and writings of these significant national figures teach children love for their nation. In these studies, children are often taken as passive, who absorb knowledge and follow ways of life and values. In my view, children also actively take a part in developing their national identity. Moreover, they also reproduce the nation through their own acts. Therefore, I have decided to conduct research with children. Nationalism research is a burgeoning field, while studies with children are sparse. What would explain this? Perhaps there is a lack of attention because in general children are viewed as apolitical or as lacking knowledge in more adult considered domains, such as politics. Some would argue that children only regurgitate knowledge of what they hear from adults or by the parents. In this way, exploring their socialization seems to be efficient, but children are actively seeking and creating understandings about the world and their own place in it,
They participate and contribute to the world as well. Why would children act differently if nationalism is considered? To give you examples about how a national culture and community is a part of children's everyday life, I give a glimpse of my study in an Australian preschool. I also introduce the concept, the pedagogy of nation that I have developed and offer two examples to show how the nation is being taught and how children learn it. Then I conclude with some takeaway observations about the importance of this research. Since my area of research is early childhood education, I set out a decade ago to explore nationalism and three five years old children's everyday life in an Australian preschool. As part of an ethnographic research, I spent whole days in the preschool for two years to understand the texture of everyday life. At the start, it was easy to pinpoint state sanctioned symbols or iconic representation of the nation, maps, and flags, national holidays and their celebrations, iconic picture books and stories were omnipresent. It was much more difficult to get to the enactment of national culture in everyday life. Since national culture makes familiar everyday life, it seamlessly underpins practices. In other words, most of the time national practices are not easily observable, since they seem taken for granted even for the researcher, who is part of the national community as well. This fact gives a very difficult job to researchers since they study something that is more hidden. It requires the development of a methodology. This is what I set out to do. Based on my observations in 2013 and 2014, and therefore theoretical engagements, I have developed the concept of the pedagogy of nation to be able to recognize and systematize the different ways the nation appeared in everyday life in institutions created for young children. The pedagogy of nation is composed of three areas. The first one is human and non-human didactics. This includes the explicit instruction of teachers, for example, when they read a story, lead conversations or engage in activities with children and, and the ways in which children imitate and recreate those elements into new variations. It also includes objects as part of an object environment because they carry symbolic meanings and therefore a pedagogical force and children can use those to enact the nation with. The second area is emotions and effect that can also work as deductive means. They vitalize the subject by drawing bodies under their force. Emotional atmospheres envelop bodies and orient actions. Emotions and effect include human gestures, eye gaze, exclamations or self-talk, emotionality arising through a song, sensations such as walking in the forest or emotions expressed during celebrations. The third area is special and temporal regularities that help individuals to orientate within the place and which also connects with other places. For example, the rhythm and routine of life in preschool connects with work and family life. Temporalities play an important role in habituating children's bodies and actions and in creating spaces for children's reactions and self-authored actions. Punctuality is another example for temporality and is very important in Finnish society, or the allowed level of noise marks spaces which is also important in Finnish preschools. Let me give you an example to show how the pedagogy of nation works in the observed preschool. After returning from a family holiday, Lucas drew a map about their travel route around the islands of New Zealand and back home to Australia. The trip is on the right hand corner of the drawing. He also shared their travel story and explained the picture in response to my questions. He pointed to the top part where he has written Moscow and said, bad place to visit and pointed to the written name of Russia and Afghanistan. He continued, 
they fight in Russia. There are people fighting in Russia. And he started to draw two stick figures, maybe fighting. People fight in Russia and Afghanistan and other places. Lucas turned his face towards me, erected his body so he looked taller and gave a meaningful smile. Do you know what the writing says? He asked and continued drawing. What? I asked. His face lit up and he turned towards me. Bad place to visit. Bad place to visit. I repeated. Bad place to visit Russia and Afghanistan. He repeated with a raised tension in his voice. Bad place to visit Russia and Afghanistan because they are fighting there. I repeated with excitement since I understood what he meant. He continued the writing with full concentration and I asked, do they fight in Australia? Nah, Lucas responded with a disaffected tone of voice and not even looking at me, he was just shaking his head. As he finished the drawing, he withdrew his body from the desk and turned to me with a smile on his face and said in an excited tone of voice, see, there is an exclamation mark and he pointed to it. He was raising both arms, then shook them while he, shout he was shouting in a frightened but smiling face. Bad place to visit Russia where the blood is scared. What we can assert here is that Lucas has learned symbolic markers of places, such as the globe and map and the names of nations, which knowledge he reproduces here in a new constellation in relation to his travel. The stick figures and his excited tone of voice express both excitement and fear of this distant place. Traveling around and being in Australia feels secure. He fears being affected by the war, categorizes these feelings and attributes affective states to countries. Russia and Afghanistan becomes the bad places to visit. Sitting together in this situation and through a shared visceral response, Lucas and me, the researcher, created a collective us in Australia where we belong, sitting safe and secure, gazing at the other at war in Russia and Afghanistan. This scenario also gives an example of how representation of nations, excitement and anxieties and values, good and bad, come together contributing to the creation of national myth and stereotypes about the other. As this, and the example I started this lecture with, the newspaper report on Russian schools show, children's lives are affected by political events and anxieties portrayed in the mass and social media and discussed in families or in the public. The portrayed knowledge and feelings contribute greatly to children's developing view of the world. They also serve as basis for their active learning and recreation of national divisions, myth, stereotypes, and belonging expressed in their own ways. These pictures portray a barbecue scene in the preschool. Let me give you a simplified summary of the observation. In the scenario, there were four boys sitting on the chairs holding their water bottles and gazing at the large plastic building blocks in front of them. Plastic fish and crabs were placed on the wire rack in front of them. The children were sitting in a very relaxed sitting pose, legs spread out wide and their bodies were slouched down in their chairs. To my question, what is happening here? They excitedly responded in chorus. We are drinking here, only for boys. I asked, can I come in? The firm answer arrived in a matter of fact tone and deep voice. Girls cannot come in. I answered, I am not a girl. One of the boys wrinkled his forehead and looked straight at me with a serious face and in a forceful tone he stated, you are not a boy, only dads can come in. Dads have beer. I asked, what do girls have? Another boy responded that, girls have drinks. In this scenario, with the selected objects, the children delimit and reconfigure an area in the garden of the preschool. They use the boat 
camping chairs, bottles, grass, plastic stands, wire rack and toy fish and crabs to recreate the barbecue setting. They enact a gathering around the barbecue, a common way of socializing in Australian families. The configuration of objects, relaxed manner of sitting and effective responses creates togetherness and a relaxed atmosphere. In their masculine togetherness, women, like the researcher, are excluded. The masculine play performance of the barbecue draws on their embodied and observed knowledge. The boys generate a shared social life with an egalitarian and exclusive quality. Drinks and food salmon the bonds between males, term mateship in Australia, a long-standing but transforming Anglo-Australian relation between men. In the barbecue scenario, objects teach children how to be and act as they enact the male sociality characteristic of the masculine national identity. Through their expressed emotional connection as males, they feel belonging and maintain long held traditions concreted in a national myth of mateship. With the introduction of the concept of the pedagogy of nation and its exploration in an Australian preschool, I aim to show children's active engagements with the nation. I showed how they learn national ways of being, perform emotions and attachments for their nation. I highlighted how they interpret and enact national stereotypes and myths and recreate all these in their own ways as part of play. To finish this lecture, I draw out some important takeaway observations and give some reasons why this research is important. In my research, I aim to show how children create their national identities, learn, identify with, and recreate national myth, acquire beliefs and virtues, and form an emotional attachment to homeland. Routines, national symbols and customs, traditions, emotions and atmospheres, rhythms, of life underpin children's lives. They observe, follow and interpret these to find their way around the moral orders of a given national community. Children also draw on these to coordinate their activities across different places and they allow children to experience themselves as national subjects. Children can use these sources to express patriotism they can also resist national ideals and include and exclude by using national stereotypes. National stereotypes intersect with race, class, gender, ethnicity, religion, language, land, and other cultural markers. Exclusions and discrimination thus are more frequent or forceful towards those who are deemed as different in multiple ways. Children's identification with an enactment of the nation is most visible in societies experiencing conflict. In these societies, children mobilize very early on the us and them divisions as they refer to national differences. These divisions sit uncomfortably with the reality of multicultural and globalizing societies today. Despite a transnational world, the nation state remains the prime organizing political unit and social force. Therefore, researching childhood and nation is very important today, when in many countries and across the whole political spectrum and in public domains, nationalism takes new and more exclusive forms. In Europe, extreme far-right nationalists call for more support for a national way of life and greater opposition to multiculturalism, internationalism and the European Union. One consequence, among many, is that previously settled matters around racism, fascism and migration are once again up for debate, with elected officials and media personalities able to express any number of views without recourse to an apology. As I have shown, children are neither immune to nor remain just a passive observer of these developments. <laughs>